Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, well, let me start out first by saying that it's really cool to see so many people working with Electron nowadays. Um, yeah, so this is my first time doing a talk here at Electron Talks. And it's my understanding this is like a larger meetup that like skill levels are going to be very significantly. So I'm going to just give a general overview of how we tested our app. Um, but if it, like, feel free to ask me questions at the end and I can go more into depth on certain things, right? And, uh, or yeah, or reach out to me on social media. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna keep the talk a little bit on the short side because like most people tend to check out after like 15 minutes anyways. So yeah, so my name is Angel Gomez. Um, I work at Oculus. Um, I'm on the Oculus PC core team. Um, so yeah. If you haven't had a chance to check out an Oculus Rift or the Oculus PC app itself, um, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is what the, the Oculus PC app is like people's first foray into the VR ecosystem before they actually get into VR. So before they, like we, the people can set up their account and their VR persona here. Um, people can set up their hardware and the general VR ecosystem. Um, they can access the Oculus storefront, manage their app library, access social features, et cetera. Like we're still going to be adding more and more stuff as we go. So our app is built in Electron uh, using React and we use C++ for the native code. And for, so for mostly for hardware interactions and for actual library interactions. And yeah, so basically what this talk is going to be about is how I used, um, how, how I implemented end-to-end -end testing for our app and the technical decisions and challenges that came about with it. So before I go into detail over this, um, I think it's a valid question of why should we even end-to-end -end test, right? Especially like what additional value does it provide other than saying like having 100% unit test and snapshot test coverage? And because like, first of all, end-to-end um, -end tests are a little bit tedious to write. So it has to have some value. And so, there's a lot of valid reasons to end to end test. Like, so first of all, it allows you to test a key flow from the very beginning for like, from when you start up the app all the way to the end. And this way you can ship code with like near absolute confidence that it's not going to break something. And so even though at Oculus, we have a fairly large QA team, uh, we're pretty unique at Facebook because we're the only people that have a, well, we're one of the few teams that actually have a QA team. Um, it's pretty repetitive because like they have to run the exact same flows every single like day. So it becomes really boring for them and it becomes really easy for them to start glossing over things. So this way it has like, we can run them repeatedly every time the, the, the code hits automation and we have an exact way to reproduce bugs based on how the actual test is written. So here you can actually see like one of our, purchase flow test running. Um, this one's actually going to fail because it has a credit card number that obviously doesn't work. But like, it's pretty magical the first time you see it, just like run through everything super quickly and go through privacy settings, log in, put in their credit card info, and there you go. So yeah, so what should be tested? Um, it's really nice to have 100% coverage when you test, but it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily realistic when it comes to end-to-end -to -end testing, especially because if you want people to run them, like it's important to keep in mind that end-to-end -to -end tests take some time to run because they actually have to open the app, click through things. So I think it's probably just a better goal to test the key business logic of it. So in our case, um, we like some of the stuff we test started testing initially was time to interaction because that's very important from a user experience perspective. Um, user sign up, user sign in, new user experience, including hardware emulation, and then other app flows. So purchase, which was the one we went through before, um, friending, and other stuff. So there are a couple of needs that we had that were specific to our implementation versus other end-to-end -end stuff. And the first one starts that we needed it to be in JavaScript because everybody on the team is primarily a JavaScript developer. So ask them to write tests in Java or Python it's just not going to happen. So that, that was the first need. Then performance. The test suites have to run quickly so that people, um, people will actually run them. And like, after all, like the mantra at Facebook is move fast or something. And third one is features. 
Um, features have to be simple to use because um, developers are lazy about writing tests. So we we wanted to add like helper functions to cover all of the normal all the normal usage. So like clicking, right clicking, scrolling through stuff, providing input, etc. Then um, value. Tests have to have some sort of value to both the developer. Otherwise, it just becomes, it becomes a hurdle to actually getting code checked in. And people will just write less tests as a result of that. The next one was that it had to use Jest. Because Jest is great, and we're already using it for unit tests. So we might as well use it for our end-to-end -end tests as well. It has to be reliable. Um, I know flaky tests have historically been an issue with end-to-end -end testing, but um, we definitely want our tests to be able to run deterministically because otherwise people will just start ignoring them when they get red flags in automation. So the first thing we did is that uh, we ultimately decided to go with Spectron. Um, there's a couple of things, to, uh, there's a couple of options to choose from when, when like choosing to do UI testing. And I had initially considered using Puppeteer because it's the new hotness made by the Chromium team, but it doesn't actually work with the Chromium version that's bundled with the Electron build we're currently using. So then I actually looked into Spectron, which I don't even know how I missed it, considering it's like the official Electron implementation, right? So it's, it's pretty amazing. It's by far the easiest solution to implement because you just pass in the parameters for your app and just instantiate the app and it's good to go. It provides you access to the Chromium and Electron APIs out of the box and you can interact through the UI using WebDriver, which is really important to us, uh, but I'll, I'll get into that a little later on. Um, you can access the renderer process, the main process with, with IPC straight out of the box. We did, however, make a tiny modification to Spectron. Um, it's really simple because we use Yarn um, with an offline mirror. So we don't want our automation phoning home to, to like anything. So we basically just set it up so it would use a checked-in version of Chrome driver instead of downloading it. WebDriver. So WebDriver is pretty much just a remote control interface that, uh, from their website, Web, WebDriver is a remote control interface that enables introspection and the control of user agents. Um, it pretty much just provides a platform for a language neutral to wire protocol that you don't need to actually be in the process for the program to control it. For, to control a web browser. So we used webdriver.io because it's written in JavaScript. Uh, you can write your tests in JavaScript and it's what comes bundled with Spectron. So that would make an easy choice. And it, webdriver.io, the difference is just that it's a library that provides no JS bindings for, for a webdriver. So overall, the syntax is a little bit counterintuitive for JS developers that don't typically write end-to-end -end tests. So we implemented a few abstractions to that. Um, so for example, we have an abstraction called click on element once loaded, which takes a test ID as a param, and it basically just formats the selector for it. So this, well, the way we do this is that we just pass in a, a, um, a React prop to the, a prop that says call data test ID to the element, and we propagate that down using a Babel plugin that I wrote. And this is really helpful because it allows us to like type check our, our abstractions and we use flow at Oculus. So we just like pull that in. And it, so the reason we actually ended up choosing, like think WebDriver is a really good option is because it's been around for a long time. It's basically the industry standard right now. And we can also use it to test our 3D surfaces because we are using React VR. So, why we wanted to use Jest. Um, Jest is simple to set up. We were already using it. It requires very minimal additional configuration. So we basically just um, copied over our Jest config and just adjusted it a little bit. And um, another cool thing that it does is that it parallelizes testing. So we use a mocked version, uh, a version of our app that mocks out the native code, or a lot of the hardware interactions and a lot of the library interactions. So this allows us to run multiple instances of the Electron app at the same time. So this reduces our testing time very significantly. So 
considering that we're running a couple of things at the same time, we want to make sure that everything is deterministic. So we want to clean up the instances of the app every single time we start the test. So whenever we, we mount a test um, on the before each function of the just test, um, we first check that the app state is completely clean. And if not, we clean it up. And then we set up a brand new test user, which expires after some time. So we don't like have a ton of test users lingering around. And then if, um, we log in. Like this is basically just a helper function. So people don't have to write the same code multiple times. Then once we're finished, we clean up and we delete the test user in the after each call. So yeah, we basically just set up functions to take care of all of this boilerplate code because it just gets annoying to write it over again. So our tests, actual tests are just like import something and they end up being super short. So this is kind of like what our tests look like. I obviously like just dot, dot, dotted some stuff out, but basically we have a create user function, a start application, and we put that into after each, each one. And when we instantiate the test, they're all async calls. And then in, in the before each, sorry. And then in the after each, we basically stop and delete the test user. So that's what one of our tests would look like. And as I mentioned while I was talking about Jest, um, one of the advantages is that we can run multiple instances of the app at the same time. So we have two types of tests. We have, um, we do sometimes need to test hard, actual hardware interactions with an emulator or with a physical piece of hardware that's connected to our automation machines. And so the first ones are slow tests. We run these in band, meaning that each test runs up one at a time and those take a long time to, to run because you're actually doing all the interactions and it's one at a time. And then we have our tests that only test UI and network things. We use Relay for networking. So these mock out a lot of the C++ native code just in, in JavaScript. The upside of this is that we can run as many uh, instances as we possibly can. So it makes stuff run really fast. Usually when a developer is developing, they will just run these tests on their machine. So it'll probably take a minute or a minute and a half to run the entire suite. So traditionally interacting with um, UI and end-to-end -end tests has been a bit tedious in the sense that it involves waiting for an unspecified amount of time and then interacting with the element, Get, like waiting for it to load and then interacting with the element. So this kind of leads to flaky testing and flaky tests are becoming useless after some time because people just ignore them. So to mitigate this, all of our UI interactions are asynchronous. So we just await the, the function to call it, come back. We wait the amount of time necessary for the element to become available. And that's when we interact with it. This makes the test run much faster and gets rid of a lot of the traditional flakiness. So on the Oculus PC um, app, we adhere to BEM, which is block element modifier. So for our class names, so that it's kind of like a CSS convention. And I didn't want us to rely on that because as a selector that we're using for web driver, because we move things around constantly and we are reusing all of our components. Like any given page will have a ton of components with the same class name. So instead I opted for like using data test ID because that it seems like a more react like approach and it helps standardize how we're all writing end to end tests. So debugging does become an issue with end to end tests because if you're not, if you don't have clear um, error messages, you don't know where the tests are breaking. So to try to mitigate this a little and get a good, and get a good read on some of the metrics, um, we did take some stuff. So first of all, we take screenshots of important views. So whenever a test fails, we can just look at how these views looked right before the fail happens, the failure happens. And also at the very end of each test, we actually dump the renderer process and the main process into a file. And we just read these whenever something fails. Like it'll just send us an email and it'll be like, okay, this test failed on automation because of this. So lastly, we also save the TTI on certain elements because it's really important for us from a user experience perspective. We're really big on that. So there are some nuances. We don't really use expect statements all the time, which is a little weird for people that are normally testing because you're used to expecting something. And the way our tests fail is that if it basically doesn't finish the flow, it counts as a failure. So if it doesn't find the element that it needs to interact with after a set amount of time, which just the normal timeout is 500 milliseconds, I think, um, it just fails and that's how you know that the test failed. So we wanna get good signal from that. And 
So a lot of the time on some slower loading stuff, we do need to call just set timeout. And that also like, we have a test consistently failing because of the timeout. That's probably a good signal for us that we might want to speed up that interaction somehow. And since we're not using expect, it's really important for us to know that we have a good error messages. So we know when tests fail and we can go back and debug them. So we just dump the logs. That's like we're pretty much our way to test it and we try to have explicit throws. So going forward, we have a couple of future plans for the solution that we made for this. Um, so we wanna make reduce the dependency footprint. So even though Spectron is the best solution for the majority of cases, we might end up reducing the, the and just using the dependencies directly just because it's a lot more lightweight for us and it helps us have a little bit more control over what we need. And this will also like allow us to keep the core of the library swappable. So we probably won't ever use Puppeteer, but uh, like if we ever wanted like test some other stuff, some other surface, especially since JavaScript is a very small subsection of stuff we actually use in VR, we probably just want to be able to have the same abstractions and just swap out the core for that. And lastly, I'm personally a huge fan of open source efforts. So if it ends up making sense and it brings some value to the community, we might open source it. So yeah, so to close this up, um, I wanted to thank everybody for listening. And I hope now that you have a better idea of the ins and outs of end-to-end like, -end testing on Electron applications. And yeah, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or on GitHub. And yeah, I'll be happy to answer your questions. So. Okay, so um, so pretty much Oculus is a virtual reality company. So we have all of our, a lot of our surfaces are written in React VR. So we want to be able to test those, like be able to interact with them and eventually like other surfaces as well, just them. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, it's just mostly the, the React VR interfaces for now. No, no, I mean, I, I mean, I hope so. I mean, I hope it gets to the point where it brings enough value to the community that we can release enough something in open source. But I mean, it still has a little bit of a way to go. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Um, it just um, eases. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so what he asked is that I had to write a Babel plugin for it. And so what that kind of, why we kind of ended up doing that. So you normally tag the React element and, but you actually have to tag, tag the DOM node. So React accepts data dash whatever. And so basically you want to propagate it down to the DOM node. And a lot of the times if you leave that up to the developer, they're just like, is they're going to be lazy about it. So the Babel plugin does the best effort of tagging the right DOM node. The propagating the tag, all the, the data test ID tag, all the way down to the DOM node. Okay. Okay. So what he's asking is that he hasn't used Spectron before. So, like, when does the stuff we 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 actually built run. So we try to run it in two different times. So developers should be running it on their machines. But if not, um, once the code is checked in, like obviously before they can land their pull request, they have, it has to run through automation. So we, we have machines that are like running it consistently whenever anybody checks in code. And also before we, we cut releases. Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of things at Oculus. We have a lot of things running, a lot of tests. So, it, it, I mean, we have a pretty reasonable window of time before that people's expectations are still. Uh huh. Okay. So originally, um, we had used a couple. So whenever you try to like interact with an element for some reason in Jest, it was just the like exiting the test. So originally, we started using promises 
for that. And like, we would basically um, recursively call promises. So it would just be the promise that died, not the entire test. But then I actually just figured out that um, WebDriver has something for that. So you can just use wait for. Okay, so this question is that since we, we don't typically test, um, like especially like we don't want to be writing tests that aren't in other languages besides JavaScript, how do we build a culture of testing? So I think the most important thing for that is people have to see a value in the test that they're writing. Like if they feel that they're just writing an obstruction to get their code landed, people are going to write less tests. If it's like, like a lot of the things, I don't know if anybody's like run a snapshot test before and it, you end up breaking the snapshot and you just kind of like, glance over it, oh yeah, oh yeah, I changed that. You just update the snapshot without actually seeing what you broke. So that, that means that it's not a very valuable test, right? Like people are just glancing over it. So you want people to actually see like, hey, this is actually going to catch important stuff that might break and it's gonna break our key business logic. Okay, any more questions? All right. So thanks everybody.